I hopefully you can see my screen now. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, 11.25, so we'll get started. We've uh, welcome everyone. This uh, session called Securing GraphQL with Cost Directives. Today, I'm planning to talk about the GraphQL Cost Directive specification, uh, how it can help everybody with securing GraphQL. Uh, my name is Morris Matza from IB, IBM's uh, API Connect and Data Power Gateways. And, uh, and I'm very excited to talk about this new specification. All right, uh, through this talk, I'm gonna start with talking about why, why this is a problem at all that we're addressing, then go into what in particular the problem is and how it's solved today. Once you see if it's a big problem, that means everybody already solved it today individually. Uh, and so looking at how they did that is, is really important to then talk about what's the standardization of the solution? Why, why do we need it that way? Why is it better that way? Uh, and then what can you do yourself with your uh, with your your product or with your endpoint to take benefit from this? All right, I want to start when asking like you know why is this a major problem? Looking at this slide, this is from from API days about one year ago, July 2020, uh, from my colleague colleague Jim Laredo, and he took this from the GraphQL landscape from the GraphQL Foundation all of the companies that had advertised with the GraphQL Foundation that they were uh, adopters of GraphQL, right? And he looked for two things. First, every single one of these companies, did they have a public GraphQL endpoint, right? And he found about 20 of them did. And then other than those 20, any other companies here that had a that did not have a public GraphQL endpoint, but did have a public RESTful endpoint, right? And found that was even more, that's 30. Right, some might have overlapped, in which case we just identified them as GraphQL. But so many publicly announcing that they are GraphQL adopters with the GraphQL Foundation, they've got public API endpoints and yet not public GraphQL API endpoints. Uh, and so that's the question you asked a year ago. A lot's happened in the last year. Since then, uh, GraphQL adoption has approximately doubled 100% year over year. Uh, many, many more GraphQL projects out there. There's lots of evidence of greatly increased GraphQL use. And yet this particular situation not improved as much as somebody might've thought. So, so our, our intuition is still here. You, I, I made this new slide this year. Uh, this is the Fortune 100 companies. So just cheat is like a sampling of really large companies. Uh, and we went through with, with him and I, with somebody else, we went through uh, these, these companies. And this time we decided to do something a little different. We noticed many, many of these companies are, there is evidence that they are working on GraphQL internally. Because if you look, if you just search the open web, you see that they're advertising for positions where they need GraphQL skills. You see that there are employees of these companies, which uh, on their LinkedIn profiles, they mentioned that they're working for their company on a GraphQL project. So it's not secret that they're working on GraphQL, but, but only a smaller subset of those actually have the company having a, public GraphQL endpoint, or even a public GraphQL story, like a, like a Facebook where they go to conferences and talk about what they're doing with GraphQL. Uh, so how many are, are in that smaller group, not the larger group where, they're, where there's public evidence they're using GraphQL, but the smaller group where they're actually being public about their GraphQL adoption and, and presenting it and opening up endpoints? For that, we found 17. So not 17 in 100. So this brings us to the, the, our big question. Why are more big companies not uh, don't have public GraphQL endpoints today? Why do more big companies you know, not have big partner GraphQL endpoints today? Right? But both of these, uh, these investigations are indicating that there's something where at smaller companies and middle-sized companies, there is a much bigger adoption. And um, there's something, these companies are adopting GraphQL, but not, being, not with the public endpoints. All right. Uh, to, to go into this, I want to take just one step back. I know this at this conference, everybody's into APIs and into finance uh, at, at API Days New York, but uh, but not everybody knows about GraphQL. So I'll assume you do know, most people know about GraphQL. For everybody else, just very quickly catch up in a couple of slides. Uh, if you remember, the, the in GraphQL provider provides a, a GraphQL server, a GraphQL schema, where they advertise what they support, what what's, what uh, capabilities they provide. In this example saying you can query for a me, me is the field, query is the type, 
And so then the me field means I'm querying for that field. I'll probably be passing an OAuth bearer token or some form of authentication by which I authenticate you to make sure you really are, to know who you are. Uh, and then I can, uh, once I know who you are, I can query my backend database for my users and get my record for you. Once you have the user type, then you can query the name or the age to find out more about that user. In this case, the, the client sends a query. Could be different every single transaction. Every field corresponds to a resolver function being run on the GraphQL server. In this case, uh, Alice logs in and asks for her name and not her age, only her name. And so she gets back something that looks just like that. She's really in dramatic control of the form that the data comes back in addition to which data comes back and how it comes back. Uh, so looking just at a, a slightly more complex example, we'll look at some nesting, one level of nesting here. Here, Alice is not only asking for her name, but also her age. She decides to ask for more this time, and then for her friends, but only for their names. This is obviously a join on the backend database, but in GraphQL, it's just expressed it as a nested query. All right, so what's going to happen as GraphQL execution engine goes through this query? It's going to start with the me. Right, and then produce a me result in the out in the output. Uh, at that point, it's probably like we said, looked at the bear token, looked up the user, gotten it from the record from the database, and now has that database object locally in memory in the execution engine. So when it gets to something like name, that's just a scalar field, just a string lookup within the data it already had. So there's no more database lookup. This is probably pretty inexpensive. And the same for age. Uh, for friends, it gets a little more interesting. This is where the join's happening, right? The friends is going to have to retrieve what probably in Alice's database record is a list of IDs, and then take each of those IDs and look it up in the database to get the user record for that person. Right? And then once you have all three user records for her three friends, then it's easy enough to look up the name in each one. All right, so that's a quick background of what GraphQL looks like. The other thing I want to uh, look at is the GraphQL client. This is a standard open source GraphQL client donated by Facebook. And uh, it's been modified and skinned and all made new features added by many different UI projects. Uh, when you're running GraphQL production, you're doing a million transactions a day. It's not going through this client every time. You're just sending the transaction. But to develop your query, you, you could use a, a UI like this one, like Graphical or with Graph IQL, which this is, or a similar version like GraphQL Playground. There, there are a number of them out there. Um, and the, the point here is noticing that GraphQL doesn't just give you a fine-grained, flexible way to query data on your backend server. But once you have a fine-grained, flexible way to query your backend server, you can also query the metadata, which means that this UI can query on the backend server what types and fields it supports uh, and, and detailed information of exactly what's legal and illegal at that backend server. That means that even though this UI was not developed with any knowledge of my particular backend server, in this case, a bank, I, I, for the rest of the presentation, I, I developed a, a, a backend for a fictional bank. Uh, and we're going to be looking at stuff for this, this bank. Uh, so the, so this, this UI is going against my bank server and dynamically fetching up to date data on exactly what that server supports right now. That enables it to be a very rich, uh, up-to-date tooling environment in a, that's written in a completely generic way, so you don't have to redevelop it for every server. Uh, if we look at the left-hand pane, that's where you're developing your your uh, your query, and so you notice that there's font coloring, and that's all based on what's actually in my particular server. You see that it does autocomplete as you type; it knows where you are and what's legal at that point. You've got this uh, pop-up there giving you context or help. The full helps in the right-hand pane, but the, the full documentation, again, you know, retrieved dynamically. But it also uh, can be used at, as pop-ups exactly where you're, where you're editing. Uh, and local validation, as you type your query every, at every point, it'll be making sure that your query is valid, or if not, giving you the validation error and letting you know what's wrong as you type. Uh, so, so there's a very rich environment here that's exactly tailored. You know, it's written once and works for every single schema. This is a big feature of GraphQL, uh, and we'll look in a moment about uh, how this changes when we get to our security problems. All right. First, uh, just talking about the to go into the security problem now. I want to. There are a number of security problems. This is one I want to focus on today. The it comes like, like everything does in GraphQL from the main principle of GraphQL, which is that the client's in control. You already saw the client is controlling 
the request response flow. We saw that with Alice. If she asks for her age, she gets it. If she doesn't ask for it, she doesn't get it. If she also wants friends, she gets the, their records. If she doesn't, she doesn't get them. So what would have been four RESTful calls turned into one GraphQL call. She can combine calls. She can split calls. She can change the order she wants data back. She can change uh, the names that it comes back named as in the JSON response, all kinds of things. Um, and the uh, and, and we've also seen other ways. But let's focus on this one for now. So it's obviously an amazing GraphQL advantage that the client's in control, right? And, and that every transaction, the client's in control of the contract, which means it gets exactly what it wants. Uh, and it can, it's not overfetching. It's getting all the data at once at once instead of needing multiple round trips, all kinds of advantages. And it gave us advantages in the, in the client UI that we saw. But to any of you, it's probably clear. You're, you're running a financial institution. You're not in control of the transaction. That's a little scary. Uh, let's look at one example here. In the top left, you've got a GraphQL query. The, the I'm fetching all the data, but not really all the data, right? I asked for all the users in the backend database, but there might be tens of thousands of users. I don't want all of them at once. Let's get 1,000 users uh, and limit it to that. For every user, I'm going to ask for all their orders. Uh, but again, not every order. There might be a whole bunch. Let's get the first 1,000, and then we'll go from there. Uh, all right, so even though I'm limiting this somewhat, it's very quick to see I'm limiting it to what could be up to a million, right? If there's only three users in the backend database, it's not going to be that bad. But I might be getting a million orders back. And then for every order, I'm asking for its payment details. And uh, the payment details, this might actually be calling out to an external uh, partner, right? So maybe I'm not, that's, I'm not fulfilling that in my retail organization. I'm doing that by calling out to a credit card company's API. There might be some, uh, some, some, monetization of that, maybe I'm paying for every one of them, or I get a certain SLA that gives me a certain amount of transactions per day. And like, I, I don't want to be overrunning that. And this could be a million calls to my external server just for this single GraphQL transaction. So that's clearly, whether it's malicious or not malicious, either way, it's clearly out of control. Um, this has been a problem since GraphQL began. And there have been many, for years and years now, there have been many ways that people deal with this. One way is to add a timeout. Very easy to have a timeout saying no single GraphQL transaction should take more than 300 milliseconds, you know, whatever is appropriate for your server. Um, another way is that we already talked about that every field is a has a resolver function, which roughly corresponds to one REST call, potentially. Um, and so any given one of those, it's easy enough to, to look at how, how many times it's being called uh, or something like that. And, and so I can focus in on the ones that I really care about. Right, so I let's say here I don't care about all the requests to the local database. You can do a lot of them; it doesn't bother me. But the payment details really bothers me because it's going out to a third-party server. So then I I don't care about the overall time, so I don't do a timeout. Instead, I dynamically sum up the number of times you're calling payment details. If it's more than 500, I abort. All right, uh, what else can I do? I can look at basic features of the query. I can look at the document def. Make sure it doesn't get too deep. We can look to make sure it doesn't get too wide. Those are kind of warning signs that too much is being asked for in a single query. Uh, but obviously, there are limitations to that. So I could do a more of a full cost analysis. I could take the query and do some analysis to say, how much CPU would I be running on my backend servers? How much memory would they be using? How much money would I be spending towards third parties if I had to run this query? All right, and use that as a way of, uh, of doing threat protection. So obviously, that one's really hard. And the first three were pretty easy. So I would rather use one of the trivial ways. There are some problems, however. Right? The top two are dangerous because they allow partial query execution. By the time I get to 300 milliseconds, or by the time I've done 500 payment details calls, I've already done a lot of the bad work that before I stopped it, before I cut it off. Um, and for so, so we really feel we have to do the bottom. And I can't get away with just nesting depth or nesting width. Because look at the top left, it's, it's got a width of at most one per level and only a depth of four. So it's a totally reasonable sized query in depth and width, but it's clearly an out of control query. All right, so I have to do something deeper than that. Uh, and that's what that's what we've, we've been recommending. And that's what everybody does in the industry, right? And we, uh, for who has a serious uh, large endpoint. Uh, so I want to look at that. And before we, we look at how people solve it, just to point out, this is a real problem. Uh, if you, I think many people are used to GitHub. I happen to take this picture from the IBM cloud. I think it's true for every big or most every big uh, GraphQL endpoint, which is that you've got single types. Here you see a single type that's got 
a whole lot of fields, and also that you've got many, many connections between types, which means that I can get to extremely extreme nesting depths, right? So widths and depths can get large, and very small, relatively small queries can end up being querying for lots and lots of data. All right. So I, I mentioned several times that everybody's already solved this if they've got a big public endpoint. If you think about it, those big companies, the biggest companies in the world, you know, a whole bunch of them are already having public GraphQL endpoints. So obviously, they can't leave it susceptible that any single transaction can take them out. Right. All right. So what are they doing? They're solving three problems. Problem number one is that no single transaction should be so large that it's going to cause a problem. So we call that threat protection. Right. Problem number two is that even if no single transaction is so large, a single customer, a single client should not be asking for so much data and taking so much of what are their CPU, memory, money, whatever, taking up so much resource on my back end that other clients don't get as much because of resource starvation. Right, so that's rate limiting. I'm going to rate limit a particular client, uh, and the third one is monetization. Uh, you know, that's why you're doing APIs is largely to then monetize them. Uh, and any of these three, I can't do what I used to do for REST now because of these problems we've been talking about. Right, threat protection it just doesn't work to protect my backend. Say you only get ten transactions per second if one transaction can be doing a million things, right? Which GraphQL enables for rate limiting. Uh, Right, I, the same thing. I let one client only do 10 things per second. If each one of them is a million, that's out of control. And monetization, how am I going to monetize and give you what transactions per second, or only, uh, you know, or give different different tiers based on rate? I, any monetization plan for GraphQL will not make sense unless I'm taking GraphQL complexity, GraphQL cost into account. All right, so this is a problem for every major public GraphQL endpoint, as I've mentioned. I want to look at how three, three of the most famous big public GraphQL points are dealing with this. Uh, they deal with more than one thing each. Right? But for the purpose of this talk, I want to take three slides and just look at a cursory level what each of the three is doing, GitHub for threat protection, Yelp for rate limiting, and Shopify for modernization. Uh, take screenshots from their public documentation on, their, on the open web uh, of how they're doing this, uh, and so we can get a sense of how everybody's dealing with these problems today. All right. Uh, for GitHub, we're looking at threat protection. This is a screenshot from their documentation. They, they, you can follow the link at the bottom if you want to see any of where uh, where they're advertising these things. So they're using the relay connections pattern, uh, GraphQL pagination to use con uh, connection objects for for lists, and each of those with a first or last argument as a as a slicing argument to tell you how big the slice is, how much data is coming back in a given list. They require you to have at most 100 for any of those values. And for individual, uh, any single call, this is threat protection, they're saying that if you statically analyze it and see that how much data might be returned, it can't exceed a half million nodes. So think about this is GitHub. Maybe you're querying for a repo and then asking for every issue on that repo. So if it's a new repo and it's only got three issues, and even if I say, give me up to 100 issues, it's only going to give me three. Right? But GitHub's doing a static analysis before running the query. And if you say, give me up to 100 issues, then they're going to count on it as if 100 might be coming back, because they, they want to be able to do this analysis before running the query, right? before taking bothering their backends and back bothering their database to look up your repo. You want to make sure you're not making an unreasonable query. Uh, and so they limit you to, to a query that will not possibly return more than half a million nodes. I think that is a a very uh, generous limit for them, um, and that's threat protection. Next, we look at Yelp. Like this picture at the top right is uh, from their documentation, a table saying the different parts of the graph have different weights, right? And so they're going to say that retrieving a business is much more intensive than retrieving a user, right? 10 to 1. So they're going to charge you more for it. And then also looking through your query to see how much you're retrieving a given query. And overall, in any given day, 24 hour period, they're going to give you a uh, half quarter million points. And it resets at GMT, uh, uh, midnight GMT. And that is also a screenshot from at the bottom. All right. So they're being very clear uh, with their documentation of how rate limiting is going to affect you. It's based on your query. And given your query, you can use their table and add up all the numbers and figure out how much is actually going to come back. You can figure out an upper bound. And then once you get the response back, you can see how many items, how many reviews, how many businesses, how many users actually came back. How many locations actually came back, and at that point you can figure out how much you've been charged, right? And and they've got ways for you for them to tell you how much you've been charged. But even before I ask, 
I can guess how much I'm going to be charged at most by using the table. Right? Okay. Shopify, this screenshot's modified a little, uh, but the bottom is not. The bottom is where they tell you that they they can't just deal with transactions uh, per second because it's GraphQL. So mutations have a higher cost of 10. Connections have a cost of two plus the number of objects, and they figure that out with first and last slicing arguments. Right? Um, and at the top, you see that how many points per second you get depends on your tier. Are you a standard uh, customer, or is it a Shopify Plus enterprise customer? Uh, the pricing is not up to me to decide Shopify's pricing. I took what I saw on their website, but uh, but you know, don't trust the prices here. The point is that, and that's the part I added the the, number, the prices to their to their slide. But the point here is that they have different tiers, and the people who pay more money get more points per second. So this is standard monetization for APIs, but it's not standard for REST in that they can't just say transactions per second. They have to say points per second and give you a formula of how to calculate points so that you have some knowledge that can predict how expensive it's going to be. Right? So we looked at GitHub, Yelp, and Shopify. And what do we see? We see they're all solving this problem because they couldn't possibly not solve this problem and have a big public GraphQL endpoint. But how did they do it? Each of them wrote a bunch of custom code for enforcement. Right, and they all did it on their own separately, and then each of them documents it on their website, public static web pages, explaining how you can calculate your cost for a query. All right, um, so where does that leave you as a customer, as a client of one of these, or, or any big public endpoint? It means that you've got a um, you've got your graphical or whatever client you have that shows you up to date uh, information from your backend about types and fields uh, and Everything else, directives and everything else, and it, and you've got, you know, local validation, and you've got everything helping you form your query, and it's very deeply integrated. And then when you want to know, well, now that I formed my query, but do I can I ask for this much at once, or is it going to be too much? Is it going to be too expensive to my rate limit? Is it going to get by threat protection? Is it within my monetization limit? Or do I need to pay more for monetization because I'm using more data here? And you want to answer all these questions, then you go to their public website. And you make a bunch of calculations manually. This information is not you know, up to the second automatically updated. You have to refresh your web page if you want to see it. This information is not integrated into your experience, and it's not automatically calculated for you. You have to calculate yourself. So clearly, the picture at the left is the GraphQL promise, the GraphQL dream, right? This is the, the client is in control. Everything is done optimized for the client. And clearly, the right-hand side is not. Clearly, the right-hand side is, is something that's not quite up to it. And that's what we're trying to, to, uh, to solve for the industry, hopefully, with uh, industry-wide uh, contribution to the spec. So let's talk about the goals of the spec. There's, this is a topology of a typical GraphQL um, pattern. right? So I start at the left with the client. He wants to be in control. He is in GraphQL in control of the contract. And he wants to be able to decide how expensive a query is going to be before he sends it. We get to the middleware, zero or more levels of middleware. And they want to be able to uh, enforce threat protection, rate limiting, and monetization. And then the server tier has a GraphQL execution engine and possibly also some middleware component that's enforcing limits. And as the backend that knows the GraphQL execution engine, it wants to be able to express how expensive things are for it, what the cost is uh, in, in this process. So overall, this leaves us with needing two major things. Part one is that the schema, in the schema, the server has to be able to advertise how expensive stuff is. And part two is every one of these three tiers wants to be able to calculate how expensive a query is given that extra information in the schema. All right, so I want to look at those two in turn. Uh, but first, just to, to compare this to the, to the before picture, right? GraphQL today, GraphQL has always had the server provide extra information in the form of a GraphQL schema that tells you, for example, what the types of fields are. The middleware has always done validation using that schema information to protect the backend and not let certain things get to the backend at all. The client has always used that extra information that it gets in order to provide better UI. And so what this spec is saying is just, let's let the server give extra information, also about cost. Let's let the middleware do extra enforcement with that extra information. And let's let the client do extra, extra UI experience. Every one of these pieces is obviously done independently with this common language. All right, so I said there's two parts, the schema and then calculating the cost. So what are the extensions to the schema? Here's one of them is type cost. Types roughly correspond in GraphQL to the data that's getting returned. Right, Every type is returning a JSON object if you're returning JSON. Uh, and so 
so I can ask how costly it is to how big that type is, that data is, or maybe it's even how costly it is to return it or, or to fetch it. All right, let's look at an example here from my bank schema. I've got a uh, three three types here. The first type is address. It's a pretty standard type. All the fields are scalars. Not, not much is going on, um, but there are a number of fields. So maybe I decide it's got a cost of three. And then I, I write that into the schema here directly. The second one's credit card, right? Let's assume that I'm getting credit card data not within my local organization, but from a third party, maybe a credit card company um, or somebody else. And, some, and then I'm getting it from them. I've got an SLA with them. I can't make too many requ requests per second. So I want to make sure that I limit my users to not ask too many times because it does really have a cost. If my users can ask more, I'm going to need a different SLA with, with my third party. So, so I want to charge appropriately. Uh, and so I have a higher cost of 13. And finally, the account connections is just part of the relay connections pattern. And so maybe I decide that it's got a cost of one, or maybe I decide it's got a cost weight of zero because I'll only charge for the leaf nodes for the actual data. All these costs are not the point here. All these costs are choices you make. The point is that when you control your backend server, then you know how expensive these things are for you in CPU, in memory, in monetary value. And so you can figure out good costs and advertise them here in the schema. All right. Besides type costs, there's also the fields. We've talked already that fields in GraphQL correspond to resolver functions. Right? At, at a client level, we call it field cost because at a client level, it's about a field in their query. But at a server level, uh, it's a resolver function that you're running on the server. And now GraphQL is all about the client, optimizing everything for the client, so we call it field cost. Um, but it, but as, a, as a server, you're worrying about how expensive your resolver functions are. So let's look at three of the fields in the account type here. Uh, one of them is joint owner. Let's assume that joint owner is stored in a different database. Since this is a New York conference, assume that your main database, your main bank is in New York, but maybe your joint, uh, your joint owner is in Asia or in Europe or somewhere is where your, your database restored the joint owners. Um, <laughs> yeah, that'd be a bit weird for this example, but you understand the general point. And since it's in a different geo, in a different data center, that means that when you make that call, it's going to take you longer. To, to respond, it means that while you're waiting for to get back from the other geo, you're going to have to store a bunch of stuff in memory on your server here in New York, uh, and so so that's going to cost you more in CPU. It's going to cost you more in in memory. It's going to cost you more in time, right? So so you're paying more for your VMs or whatever it is, uh, and so you're going to have a cost of five. Transactions, that's not the case. Transactions, this is the bread and butter of a mobile banking application, right? Long before mobile banking existed, banks were optimizing their databases. They hired database optimization experts. They optimized the schemas. They put in stored procedures. They did whatever they could to make it really fast, given your, your account to get transactions back. And all the more so in mobile, mobile banking, this is extremely optimized. It's going to go fast. It's not costing you a lot of money as the bank. Therefore, you give it a weight of one. Right? And family members, this one maybe is very quick to retrieve, uh, the raw data, but it's sensitive data, so you encrypt it. And the encryption means that you need more CPU to do the encryption and decryption. You need more memory to do encryption and decryption, so we'll give it a cost of seven. It's even more expensive than that joint owner. All right. Again, you see all these costs are, are added to the schema in the left. Right. So I express it as the back end owner, and anybody can use it. All right. The next thing is list size. We talked previously in our examples, if you, if you don't know how big a list is that's going to be returned, which the GraphQL spec gives you no way to know, then it means that I don't know how many objects are going to be returned. Even if I know the type cost of each one, if there could be arbitrarily many, I have no clue what my type cost is. And the same with those types can have fields called on them. I don't know how many there are going to be. I don't know how many times I'm going to call the resolver function. So therefore, I, you know, it could be arbitrarily big field costs. So I can't possibly calculate any kind of cost if I can't bound the size of a list. Right? Let's take an example here. I've got transactions. Right? Transactions, this is using the basic GraphQL pagination, relay connections pattern. I've got first uh, cursors after and before, and I've got slicing arguments of first and last. Right? But there's nothing in the GraphQL spec that says first and last are the actual, uh, the actual slicing arguments. And in fact, you know, I personally have seen a bunch of companies, we've got customers who have uh, slicing arguments that are much more, that are not the standard. They're much more complicated. They go in and they've got an input uh, type here in GraphQL, which itself has a type within it, which itself has slicing arguments within it. It can get much more complicated. Um, and I need some way to know programmatically what are the slicing arguments? What is going to 
uh, if it's not the standard pattern, what's going to bound it? So here I've got these directive arguments. I've got the one slicing arguments that just tells me first and last are the two slicing arguments. And then when I'm actually using the standard pattern, right, then it means that I'm not sizing a list return right here, which some people do, but instead I'm returning uh, uh, the, the list return by, a, the, by the object, a child within the object that I'm returning. And so this is sliced fields, is, sorry, sized fields is telling you which field am I sizing with my slicing arguments. All right, that's when I'm using the standard pattern. Let's assume I'm not using the, this. I don't have any slicing arguments. I just return the array itself, All right? So here I've got transactions still, but I've changed it to return a list of transactions directly. I still got cursors, but look at the comment. This is documented in the, in the GraphQL schema in the comment. It says that it's going to return five transactions before or after the cursor. Right, um, which means that I just I baked that in to my backend. I said I don't want the client to be in control of how many and let them maybe do a million. I'm just gonna I'm gonna always give them five, but I let them paginate. I still have a cursor. All right. So at this point, the um, you know there's there's no slicing argument for you to determine from the query how many it is, but it's very completely clear from the comment. And so I add a directive in here saying assume size inside the list size which means there's an upper bound. If there's only two more transactions, I'm only going to get two, but there's going to be at most five returned. All right, what if I combine these? Here I've got transactions, which, uh, which is returning a transaction connection, right? But does not have any slicing arguments to control the size. So in this case, it still has documentation. I see documentation in the schema saying that it'll be at most five. And so I turned that into the assumed size, just like I did in the last slide. But it's no longer turning a direct list. So I need the size field to say what it's sizing, right? just like two slides ago. So this is you know, just combining the two features. There's a lot more to the spec. I'd refer you to, to follow the link that I'll give you to the spec to, to look at more. But this is an example of, um, I think, the last five slides we've seen the, the key, the most common use cases that people need to, to express cost in their schema. All right, so if I've expressed cost in the schema now, the thing that remains, I told you there's only two halves, the other half is using that information. So here we've got a query on the left-hand side. I'm asking for my account, right, for mobile app, for my bank, mobile banking. I want to know my account. And then I want the account's name. I want the last five transactions. I can see the most recent stuff. I want to know whether there's another page of transactions, so I need a next button or allowing scrolling. I want to, uh, and then for each of these five transactions, I'm going to want its date and its amount. So I'm going to do a static analysis of this of this uh, query. And on the right-hand side, just keep a tally of how many times I've seen each, seen each type and how many times I've seen each count. Start at the top with query. Uh, that's one query type from the, the root schema. Then I get to account. I see that it's one field count. Uh, for a query dot account and one time that'll return the the account type. Then I'm going to skip name because it's a scalar. Uh, that's configurable in the spec, but by default we assume that scalars. You know, most likely I I already retrieved uh, something from my backend database. I've got in the execution engine's memory. I've got the object. And I'm just pulling the the scalar field from that object, so it's almost three. And so I'm going to give zero weight to that. So I'm going to skip the scalar. Move on to transactions. Here I've got one more query. Uh, field and one more type. Uh, and But then I've also got a directive, right? Because of the spec, I've got a directive on this part of the schema that tells me, amongst other things, that last is one of the slicing arguments. So I can take that five and know that that's going to bound something. And I know that the sized field is edges. So I know when I get to edges, that's the thing that's that size is bound by this five, right? So I remember that for the future and then just keep going. Page info is pretty straightforward, right? Add another one and another one on the right hand side has an page of scalar, so I skip it. When I get to edges, this is where I do the, the, the stitching together, right? I take my five from the last and I apply it to edges, which means if I look at the right-hand side, transaction connection dot edges is one, right? Because I'm only calling that resolver function once, but it's gonna return a list of five transaction edges. So at the top right, I add a count of five for how many transaction edges I'm having. And then once I traverse down into this blue box, right now I'm traversing down five times because I got five of those objects. So when I hit node, I'm actually running the resolve function five times once per object I'm running it on. And then that each time returns one transaction, so I'm running that five times. All, right, all that I have left now is to sum up the total cost. As you understand, this is a weighted sum, right? Because I have 
uh, maybe different costs. Maybe some fields are more expensive than others. But for the purpose of this slide, let's just make it easy for you to do the mental math. So we'll assume that everything has got a weight of one, which means that the sum, weighted sum becomes a, a simple sum. And so you can look at these numbers at the right hand side and see easily that the type cost will sum up to 14 and the field cost to nine. All right, so that's that's a very quick walkthrough of an example of static query analysis. If you look in the spec, it also talks about dynamic query analysis and response uh, and analysis of the query response. And so, so there's more places you can do this and more ways you can do it. But that's the that's the basics: is attaching extra cost information to the to the schema and then using it in the um, when when you're looking at a query. Uh, why might you want to do this? Now that we understand the spec at a basic level, why, why is it interesting, right? We've got the, uh, I, I, I think that it overall should be summed up as interop. And then for you, what's the advantage is not having vendor locking, right? Interop means I can develop this separately at the client in the middleware and the back end. Uh, and it means each of them can be running separate software that just all from separate companies that all corresponds to the spec. It means that you don't have any vendor lock-in. You can always switch your vendor. Uh, it means that you can express it in your schema in one way without having to worry about also doing parts on the other sides. That it means that we can optimize the UI separately. Uh, like I'll show you a UI in a demo in a moment, but the point of the UI is just to show you something's possible. It's not to show you the best thing to do, but with a real spec, different people can compete on how best to integrate this into the UI and we can get some really good UI uh, integrations. So that, that kind of stuff, right? And, every, and uh, obviously enforcing their production rate limit and, and monetization. All right, before I go to that demo, let's just quickly look at what is out there for the spec. So we've got some uh, an intro and some videos up to, to explain stuff a little more uh, easily in the at this URL. That also has a link to the actual formal specification, uh, which is at this second URL direct link. Uh, and then we've set up a place to publicly discuss. We just came out the spec about a month ago today. And so far, several companies have talked to me privately. If you want, you can get my contact information from the conference. You're welcome to contact me privately, and we can talk. Uh, we've also set up this, this uh, Slack, and you know we'll move uh, with everybody else. But right now, this is in the GraphQL Foundation uh, Slack workspace. So you can go there to publicly discuss, uh, publicly discuss uh, any comments anything you want to change. We have actually gotten some good feedback already. Uh, one of the companies uh, that talked to me has an idea of maybe making something go a little more like the uh, SQL Explain using something more like that. So, so th there have been some good comments uh, that we've gotten back from other people. We have uh, we would like to evolve it. So please join us. Give us comments of what to do. If you are a vendor, you can you know, talk to us about implementing it also in your in your uh, product and what you need to change in the spec, so that'll be good. Uh, and or anybody using it, you know, contact us if you want to help uh, using it yourself. All right. So with that, I think I will switch here to a demo. Uh, and so we'll go through quickly, just showing. Here is uh, this is one product that that implements some of the the spec here, uh, API Connect, and we've got. Here's a, a schema. This is the bank schema that I developed. Um, so if we look down at this type we've been looking at, account. Uh, account I think I went right by it, didn't I? Yeah, here it is. So we got account. It's got this join owner we talked about, transactions, family members, no annotations, right? Basic schema. So here I go down into my account, and I see I've got the joint owner. Uh, maybe they, we said that one was five, I think, in the slides, right? So I'll increase it to five. Uh, and here's the family members, and I can increase that to seven. So here I've I've uh, increased the cost, right? Um, and then the other thing I did here is I've got the transactions, right? And you see this one, we said we don't have to increase the cost. We can leave as a cost of one, leave the default. Uh, but how do I know that first and last are, are uh, you see these first, first and last here? How do I know that they are slicing arguments, right? And actually, this UI is learning to that. There's a warning sign here. So I can click on this warning. And you see it explains to me, it says the value of this field is a list of composite types. And, uh, and it does not have any assumed size or slicing arguments. Therefore, the API gateway has no idea if it encounters it, how many items in the list might be returned. And so this, the, the AI here has figured out that it is a problem and has a bunch of items, suggestions, recommendations of what to do. Uh, starting from the highest confidence to lower confidence answers 
right? The best answer first, there are a few answers here. Um, but the best answer is probably first and last are both, uh, those are the typical names, they're probably both slicing arguments. And so I can just click apply here to apply that suggestion, all right? Um, and while I'm at it, maybe I'll just click apply all. There are four other suggestions here of what it thinks I should do to clean up my schema. You can see mostly they're just using the standard pagination, but uh, standard, the, but there's also this one, uh, family members was returning a list directly, not through a connection pattern. And so for family members, we've got the uh, no, you know, no, uh, no slicing, no, no sized fields, because right, because it's not going through the connection pattern. And it also instead of first and last, it is a limit argument of less slicing argument of limit, uh, which in this case is correct. It's important not just to click apply all, right? You want to make sure you're really doing what's correct at your backend server, but that's correct. All right, so I can do all of that, and now I can see that for transactions. Here it is, slicing arguments has been filled in with first and last, size fields has been filled in with edges. I can save that, which republishes it to the uh, to my gateway. And what else? Let's show the source to show you that the scheme has actually been updated. All right here's the account. We see the joint owner now has a cost of five, family members has a cost of seven. Transactions, here we see it's got slicing arguments of first and last and size fields of edges, right? So everything's been added in a spec compliant way to my schema. I can then take this schema, I can download it here, I can check it into source control, I can use it on a different system uh, from a different vendor because it's all standard, right? All right, meanwhile, let's go over and look in a UI. So here I've got a simple request that uh, to ask for an account, right? And you see I've got a type cost here of two and a, uh, field cost of one. I've set up something for this, just for the purpose of this demo, saying you get a thousand points per uh, per minute. And so type cost of two, because there's two types here, the query type and the account type, field cost of one, because there's only one field. I can get help here to see all that information. But in general, an end user might be less interested in the details. They're more interested in that, even though with uh, one of them being allowing a thousand per minute and the other like 500 per minute, the net effect is I'm only going to get 500 per minute on this query. And so here's my query limit of 500 per minute. Let's make that a little bigger. You see? So as I, and then since it's all integrated, right, as I go in, I can say I want more from the account. Like I think we said maybe I want a join owner, right? And for that join owner, maybe I want their credit card number. And, and, right? and notice as I'm typing, the query limits is changing. I can now only get, 142 per minute in. All right, besides the joint owner, let's ask for some transactions, right? We said this is going to be sized by this argument, so that last of five, um, right, which is going to size this edges. And maybe what do I want? The description, and you see the type ahead, let's say the uh, amount. Amounts of transactions are really important. All right, so now I'm down to a query limit telling me I can only do the 66 points per minute, right? And I noticed I did all that without running the transaction. Here's the uh, result, it's still empty. I can press run now and go run it and see the result. Here it goes, I get a, I get a result, right? But the, the uh, don't worry, all fake credit card numbers. But the, uh, but the, you know, even without running it, I got, I just, you know, every, every keystroke, I'm getting my up-to-date limits of if I do this, I'll be able to get 66 times per minute. And so I can tell whether, you know, if my limit is, is larger or smaller, I'm going to want to be in control of how complex my query gets and maybe sign up for a more expensive plan or maybe sign up, uh, maybe make my query smaller or something like that. All right. Uh, we just have a couple minutes left here. So I'll show you, uh, leave a minute for questions, but maybe I'll show you just changing something. So if I go back here, let's say something is more expensive, uh, not an account, let's say credit card, right? We talked maybe credit card goes to a third party server. Right, and so I need, I really want to make credit card much more expensive because it's costing me actual, my my enterprise real money, right? So let's say I set that all the way up to 100, right? Uh, let's save that and let that be redeployed to the gateway. Um, and, you know, it might not be, so it might not be what I just said, right? It might not be that it's, that it's a, a third party server. Maybe it's just that I have to go to a different geography to get the credit card data within my enterprise. Or maybe it's some other reason. But whatever the reason is, on my backend server, it costs more CPU. 
or more memory or more monetary cost. And so I'm increasing the cost to 100 to make it much more expensive. All right. So now, again, all the up-to-date data is instantly here. So if I go back to my user, um, I can start retyping this credit card. I see that it's going to be much more expensive. It's uh, giving me uh, eight times per minute only. Right. And so you can imagine, like I said, much better UIs. If you, if you use the spec, I don't have to only display this query limit at the bottom right. I can do other things. But basically, I see that my credit card is very expensive. So maybe I don't want to ask for the joint user whose credit card. And now instead of eight per minute, I get 76 per minute. And as an end user, I can very quickly make these changes. And I'm back to the GraphQL promise. right? I'm back to the GraphQL promise of having this all be integrated, very easy for the client. I don't need to go to everybody's custom static web page and try to manually do calculations to figure out how expensive this would be for me. Uh, and, and yet, I didn't need to do all of that at every single customer, every single uh, company. right? Everybody can do it uniform. Uh, so, so we and there are there are already a bunch of different things, uh, open source projects and stuff to do very different similar things. But we really feel that standardizing it can get us all these benefits. So that's the uh, my presentation. I can go back to uh, this slide and ask: Does anybody have any questions? Maybe Olga can tell me uh, if there are any questions. Almost out of time. We do have a couple minutes. Nothing has come through the chat yet. So again, if you have any questions, either request to come on and ask the question live or just put it right into the chat. Nope. All right. So we'll wait, wait a minute, see if anybody's coming with questions. Um, and what else can I say in the meantime? So we, we uh, like I said, we have released this about one month ago, at uh, the end of June. And uh, we've had a few companies, different companies interested working together. Um, we've got the Slack open at the GraphQL Foundation Slack server, which we hope to move to Discord soon. And we, uh, but then, you know, so you're welcome to just, just go click this link right here at the bottom and ask anything there. If you see this recording later and you can't ask the question live, you know, join us there or contact me personally. I'm happy to talk to you. Like I said, I know many, <laughs> several companies have, have already contacted me personally uh, and not in the not in the open. That That's fine, too. And eventually, right, if we decide we can get an industry spec, spec together, we will, you know, we'll, we'll discuss everything in, a, in the GraphQL Foundation or some open way. Hey, more. Yep. Chris, uh, a question did come in from Sebastian. How does GraphQL work with Python? Uh, GraphQL has, if you go to the GraphQL, uh, I can I can put a, a link in after the talk in the in the chat. Uh, I think you or or we can get if you send your your contact information to I put it in for Olga. We can make sure we get you that there's if you search for GraphQL Foundation, there's a GraphQL.org website and they've got a link to all the different open source implementations. So just about every language that you want around has a GraphQL open source implementation. That's for the server. Um, the uh, and the so but I don't know if you're asking Sebastian for the server or for the client. You know for client you just you can send it's very easy to send GraphQL requests. So so you know the, the UI that I was showing you for the client that's an open source UI. Uh, graphical you can you can I guess it was uh, slightly modified right so it's our uh, modified form but it's basically an open source UI. You can you can use that UI to develop your your queries, and when you're ready to send the queries if, from a real client, right, that you want in your mobile app or whatever it is, uh, you can certainly send them. You can send them from Python. You can send them from any language. Uh, it's uh, it's mostly sent over HTTP. The normal way to do GraphQL, it, it's not part of the GraphQL spec. We're working on a separate spec called GraphQL over HTTP. But it's usually in the practice, almost everybody's doing GraphQL over HTTP. So you'll send like an HTTP post with your GraphQL uh, query in it and get back a response of the JSON. It's uh, it's very easy, very easy to do GraphQL. Uh, so so if you want a server, there's many languages. We can get you the link. And for a client, it's you know very easy to just send an HTTP request. Yeah, Sebastian definitely wants to reach out to you later on. Uh, Sebastian, that's not a problem at all. Um, I can share. I don't know if it's easier over email or through the the API day system, but we can definitely share the contact and Morris is available. Yep. 
Yeah. Um, Purple also had another question specific to um, text version of this workshop, if there's one available that he can follow up and complete on his own at another time. Oh, like, uh, yeah, I, there isn't one now, but that's a good idea. Maybe I could do something. So I, I think, is this correct? You're asking for a, a, like something online that'll walk you through the steps that I just did in the demo? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a great idea. There is not anything up there like that right now. Um, but if you, I guess if you also send your contact information to, or maybe that's available already to, uh, to uh, to Olga, we can. I can try to get back to you. We can we can try to get something up for that. Great. I will copy the information and then start an email thread for both of you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, just about out of time. Any more questions? Nope. No more have come through. Oh, wait, Sebastian sent another one. Hold on. It is, and how does this work with Watson and the data science slips? Um, I'm not, maybe maybe you can follow up more in email for that one. I'm not, and tell me more details what you're, what you're asking about. You, know, you can, I don't know of a current GraphQL API in data sciences. I assume there is something out there because there's lots of GraphQL APIs been getting out there in different places. Um, certainly anything there you could use the same spec, but, uh, but it sounds like a more, more specific question. So, you know, send, send me an email, the once, uh, once Olga hooks us up an email, send me the email, the more specific question. I can try to look it up for you. Follow up. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much, Morris, for walking us through. Um, and I will send, like I said, that email to both separately and copy you on it so that I can start that email trail. All right, that's great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yep, thanks all again. Thanks, everyone, for joining.